All right, good day to everybody. We are on Second Chronicles. We remain in conversation with the Chronicler. It is May 11th, and we are looking today at chapters two through five. So uh, in chapters two through five, we uh, uh, begin uh, a fair chunk of the, of the book uh, in which uh, Solomon is building the temple and all of the excuse me, discussion that goes along with that. So um, what we get in chapter three is first the building, Solomon builds the temple and it's on the site that God has shown to David. Um, the site is of course, uh, um, Zion, eventually it will, be, will be called Zion, which is where the temple is located, but it's also identified uh, in first Chronicles as the site of Mount Moriah where where God uh, commanded uh, um, Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Um, and it's also described as God's mountain. Um, so we get some overlap here between here and first and second Kings. Uh, there's uh, in chapter four, we get, uh, and, and right into chapter five, we get uh, descriptions of the furniture, the making of the bronze altar, uh, the description of the rest of the bronze objects that are manufactured for the temple. And uh, we get uh, descriptions, uh, description of other uh, pieces of furniture. And um, so um, it's, it's really important that uh, we keep in mind that the chronicler is, again, omits things that go against uh, the idea of Solomon as the ideal king for people who are living in peace, which is what the chronicler wants to emphasize in his post-exilic context. So there's things, there's tensions that we're going to that we've read about in Samuel and Kings that we're not going to read about here. Very important uh, to point out. Uh, and so we also get the bringing of the Ark of the Covenant uh, into into the temple area and uh, the ark is brought into the temple. Notice that the Levites carry the ark. David prescribes this, but remember the whole incident of uh, uh, Uzziah being killed because the ark is starting to fall and he goes to catch it and, and he is killed because, of, because he touches the ark, but he's not a Levite. So David had uh, not followed the law in making sure that only the Levites handle the Ark of the Covenant. Here, Solomon is very careful. The Levites bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, and it's in the same month as the Feast of Tabernacles. So uh, a little bit of a refresher. The Feast of Tabernacles is the celebration of uh, when Israel had to camp out in the wilderness. It's a, it's a reminder of Israel without a home. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, at least happens in modern, in the modern Feast of, of Tabernacles, and it's also called the Feast of Booths, B-O-O-T-H, Booths, the Feast of Booths. And one of the things that you do is that you build a lean-to, you build a temporary structure as a reminder that your ancestors had to live in the wilderness, they had to camp out, they had to tent, uh, in the wilderness. I remember years ago when I was at another church, there was a small synagogue uh, not too uh, far away from the church that I served. And every uh, feast of, of tabernacles uh, in front of the synagogue, they would put a lean-to out uh, up against the pole. It was really cool, cool to look at. It kind of looked like a typical lean-to that, that any boy familiar with camping would build in the woods. Uh, and it was pretty neat. A reminder uh, that at one point Israel did not have a home. They had a temporary place of dwelling. Now, with the temple being built, the ark being brought into the temple in the very same month that you celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles is a reminder that now Israel has a home. The people of Israel, have, they have a place to live. They don't have to live in tents anymore. They can build houses. They can live in permanent structures. And now also the Ark of the Covenant the Ark of God has a permanent place, not being in a tabernacle, a tent, the tent of meeting, as it's often called, 
But now they get to be in the temple. They get to be in a permanent, God, the, the, the ark gets to be uh, in a permanent structure. Now, all of this is against the background of the idea that God, the God of Israel, unlike other gods, the God of Israel cannot be contained in buildings. You do not have the idea here. Uh, the Israelites do not uh, subscribe to what is popular in the peoples around them, that their deity only lives in the temple, that their deity is not omnipresent, not everywhere. Uh, no, the temple is the special place of the presence of God. It is where the Shekinah glory is. It is where it is the place on earth where God is most fully present. But that does not mean God is not present elsewhere. God is present elsewhere. God, the God of Israel is everywhere. And so uh, the temple just signifies the presence of God uh, in an important way, but in no way does it suggest that God is not present outside of the temple as well. And by the way, this is going to be important when we get to the New Testament, when we get to the Gospels, and in particular, the Gospel of John, where John is going to want to tell us that while God is everywhere, Jesus most fully revealed his presence uh, to the world in Jesus, who is the glory of God in uh, human form. So this is important to remember for the future. We'll get there at some point. So that is where we are today. Uh, and so tomorrow, chapter six to eight, Solomon is going to dedicate the temple. We're going to get Solomon's prayer and uh, we'll continue in the discussion of the temple uh, and its significance. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you again for the gift of this day and thank you for your presence. It is everywhere. But we thank you most of all for Jesus, who is your presence in embodied form to us, who reminds us that your love for us is so great that you became one of us, uh, that we might be redeemed, that we might be saved. So may we be the presence of Jesus for those around us in this day. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, have a great day. We will see you tomorrow.